Hi, everyone. We're just going to give people a second to enter the room before we get started. Okay, all right, I think we should get going to make sure we have enough time for the lecture and discussion. Welcome everyone to the Research Ethics and Policy Series. My name is Holly Fernandez Lynch and I'm an Assistant Professor of Medical Ethics in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy. And I am the co-chair of this series along with Steve Jaffe. Today, we're really excited to welcome Dr. Kim Smith-Whitley to discuss ethical issues arising in her work to combat sickle cell disease. And I'll introduce our speaker in just a moment, but I'll make a few quick announcements first. Um, the first of those is that these reps lectures continue to be recorded, and we've been posting the videos to our departmental website, um, usually you know, a couple of days or a week after the session. So you can go ahead and check all of those out. And this is our last session of 2021. You can see on the screen the speaker lineup for spring semester, and we'll reveal our fall speakers um, in, in January. Um, starting um, on January 10th, which is a different date, it's not going to be the first Monday, um, since that is a holiday, um, we're going to be back on January 10th with Dr. Justin Clapp, who will be discussing community consultation and emergency research. And then we'll also begin welcoming some of our non-PEN speakers back again, hopefully in person um, in a few months in the spring. Please don't forget to let us know if you have any suggestions for people that we should consider inviting for this series, um, especially individuals from diverse backgrounds who would contribute diverse perspectives to issues relevant to research ethics and policy. Okay, here's a quick reminder about some online resources from our department. These are a series of short research ethics courses that are available for free continuing education credit. And I'm pleased to announce a new addition to this list, um, which you can see at the bottom here, a course on ethical issues arising in global research. And Mary is posting the links for those um, resources in the chat. Thank you as always to our co-sponsors who helped make reps possible and to Mary Pham for her administrative excellence in making things run so smoothly. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Kim Smith-Whitley is Executive Vice President and Head of Research and Development for Global Blood Therapeutics, a company that's working to transform the treatment of sickle cell disease. She's also a professor of pediatrics at PSOM and at CHOP, she's the Elias Schwartz Endowed Chair in Hematology, attending physician in the Division of Hematology and former director of the Comprehensive Sickle Cell Center. Her research focuses on sickle cell survivorship, predicting and preventing long-term chronic and life-threatening complications of the disease. Today, she'll be discussing barriers to access to curative therapies for sickle cell disease and some of the research ethics and policy issues that may impact patients' decisions to pursue curative therapies. We are really excited to have you. Thanks so much for joining us. And um, just for everybody who's um, listening in, we'll, we'll plan to save about 15 minutes toward the end um, for Q&A and discussion. If you'd like, you can post questions in the chat as we go, and Mary will also free you up to ask your own questions when we get to the discussion period. Okay, Kim, you can go ahead and take it away. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm very excited to speak about addressing ethical issues related to sickle cell disease and curative therapies. And hopefully um, before the end of this conversation, I can also shed some light on why I decided to name this lecture, Hope Redefined. Um, here are my disclosures. I think that the thing that um, is striking to everyone is I've recently transitioned from um, academic uh, medicine into um, industry where I head up um, a research effort specifically for sickle cell disease 
um, but continue to see my patients at CHOP. Um, I also sit on the board of um, the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America and some uh, local um, advocacy organizations um, that I'll talk about later. I hope to provide an overview of sickle cell disease, um, including therapeutic options so that we can set the stage, uh, discuss curative therapies for sickle cell and um, their ethical implications, and then explore some possible solutions, um, focusing on advocacy, patient and community engagement. I'm making, making sure that everybody is on the same sickle cell disease. I'm gonna start with a general overview. Um, everyone, I think, in this audience probably realizes that sickle cell disease is the most common inherited blood disorder. Um, because individuals with sickle cell trait are relatively protected from the severe complications of plasmodium falciparum or malaria infections, in areas where malaria has been endemic, sickle cell trait has provided a survival advantage. And because of that, um, sickle cell disease primarily impacts black and brown people and tracks immigration um, patterns of the African diaspora. Although the gene is found is in every ethnic group, not just in those of recent African descent. Although sickle, although sickle cell is classified as a rare disease here in the US, um, impacting approximately 100,000, uh, with one in 365 African-Americans being born with sickle cell disease and one in 12 with sickle cell trait, in contrast, there are 300,000 born annually with sickle cell disease worldwide, with more than 100 million living with sickle cell trait. And as an example of the impact in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Ghana, um, there are one in 50 are born with sickle cell disease and one in four has sickle cell trait. Although there have been notable medical advances improving survival in those living with sickle cell disease in the US and in the UK, life expectancy remains approximately 30 years lower um, than African Americans without sickle cell disease. And unfortunately, in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, most children with sickle cell disease die before five years of age with um, 50 to 90% um, demonstrating early childhood mortality before the age of five. Sickle cell impacts every organ system. Um, sickle cell disease is character characterized by the predominance of sickle hemoglobin. When sickle hemoglobin predominates, it can polymerize or stack upon itself within the red cell. And that polymerization or stacking leads to two major problems hemolytic anemia or shortened red cell lifespan and vaso occlusion where oxygen uh, to and from tissues is impaired. Subsequently, individuals with sickle cell disease experience anemia. They also experience strokes uh, because when that vaso occlusion happens in a blood vessel in the brain, um, it can lead to oxygen flow uh, to the brain. Unfortunately, um, overt strokes uh, can occur in 15% of those by 20 years of age. And there's also something called silent strokes or subclinical strokes, um, where small areas of uh, lack of oxygen to the brain can lead to uh, cognitive impairment. And that can occur in 25% um, before the age of five years. So we know that the complications of sickle cell disease can be short-term, long-term, um, can impact every organ system. Um, but one of the things that is most uh, concerning is the unpredictable pain associated with sickle cell disease. And that's caused by lack of uh, blood flow to tissues and bones. Um, and when that happens, individuals with sickle cell disease experience uh, pain unpredictably. Also, the other thing that is interesting about this complication is pain is uh, one of the reasons that individuals come to medical attention. In fact, it's the primary reason. But 48% um, cannot experience a pain episode in the prior year. Um, and what is devastating is the end organ damage. Um, and that leads to premature death. So let's just take a little bit of a historical perspective on sickle cell. The first patient with sickle cell disease was described in 1910, it was a um, 
OMFS uh, oral surgeon student um, that came from Grenada to Chicago uh, where he got sick. And uh, when he was admitted to the hospital, the medical student looked at his blood under the microscope and described these crescent or sh sickle shaped cells. Despite the fact that that first patient was described in 1910, um, individuals with sickle cell disease for the next uh, six, six decades were um, not living long lives. And some estimates um, of 40% were surviving to 20 years of age. Um, however, there were a lot of scientific discoveries um, at the basic science level that were going on. And the genetic mutation was identified in sickle cell disease in 1959. However, it took legislation and a lot of advocacy issues to try to get uh, resources together federally to um, investigate and sponsor studies to understand the natural history of sickle cell disease and to foster research in order to make a meaningful difference to improve life expectancy. So the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America was founded in 1971. And through their advocacy, um, the 1972 National Sickle Cell Disease Control Act was passed, and that started the natural history um, study for sickle cell disease called the Cooperative Study of Sickle Cell Disease, where almost 4,000 individuals participated in that study. Uh, shortly thereafter, it was realized that the splenic dis dysfunction that is noted in children by six months of age and then led to overwhelming bacterial inf infections that could lead um, to death, um, that those infections could be prevented by tw twice daily penicillin. Um, and those studies went on to be the justification for why we needed newborn screening for sickle cell disease, because that said that if we could diagnose sickle cell disease early in life, start life-saving antibiotics, um, that we could po possibly reduce the mortality associated with sickle cell disease. Um, and so newborn screening um, came into practice in 1992 in the US. First, it was limited and targeted only to those of color and then gradually spread through most of the, all of the United States um, in a universal fashion now. Um, despite the fact that all of this was occurring, uh, we really did not have any disease modifying therapies to offer to individuals with sickle cell disease until 1995 when a chemotherapeutic agent hydroxyurea demonstrated that it could increase fetal hemoglobin, thus preventing um, the sickle hemoglobin from acting badly within the red blood cells and that that um, that medication could uh, reduce the frequency of pain episodes and other complications of sickle cell disease. So this just is another graphic depiction of what I just kind of mentioned as far as infection prevention, but I wanted to point out some of the other things other than hydroxyurea that has made a significant impact on this community. A non-invasive study called a transcranial Doppler ultrasound can screen children with sickle cell disease and predict those who are at risk for stroke um, before they actually occur. Those individuals can be started on monthly blood transfusions, which re greatly reduce the um, risk of stroke. And then some of them can be safely transitioned to hydroxyurea therapy, um, which they should use for stroke prevention for a lifetime. You can see here that the life expectancy of those living with sickle cell disease improved greatly between 1970 and 2000 when I just talked about the stroke um, transfusion for stroke prevention study. But really, we really haven't moved the bar on um, mortality after around 2000, 2006. So we're better at getting children to adult age with 93% surviving to 20 years of age. But unfortunately, early adult mortality still occurs. And so we really haven't changed uh, survival from the 42 years for males and 48 years for females with the SS type of sickle cell disease. So unfortunately, care is largely still supportive, um, particularly for pain episodes. Um, opioids are used for pain management and there are no drugs that actually shorten the course of an acute pain episode in individuals with sickle cell disease. We do have drugs other than hydroxyurea, although it took until 2018 to get L-glutamine FDA approved, 
And then in uh, November of 2019, we had a medication, crizolizumab, that um, was a monthly infusion that reduces pain in individuals with sickle cell disease and Voxellator, which is an oral pill that can uh, reduce the hemolysis associated with sickle cell disease. The other things that I've mentioned that are really important already in uh, sickle cell disease um, disease modification is the use of chronic transfusion therapy, which can be used monthly to prevent some of the complications of cell disease. Unfortunately, those are associated with complications such as iron overload, red cell alloimmunization, where the individual who receives the blood recognizes the blood from the donor as being unlike their own and can cause major complications. However, we also now have hematopoietic or uh, stem cell transplants. Um, that can be used um, either through a donor um, bone marrow or donor cord blood. And that has been um, a wonderful possibility for curative therapies for individuals with sickle cell disease. The way that this came about and it was first discovered was unfortunately there was an individual with sickle cell disease who also developed acute um, um, leukemia. And in curing, um, and in this, the desire to cure the leukemia through a transplant, that individual was also cured from their sickle cell disease. This launched a um, federally sponsored study um, of bone marrow transplantation that was then published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1996. Um, and many investigators have gone on to try to make sure that we are doing our best to modify transplant procedures so that we can increase the likelihood of event-free, disease-free survival. Unfortunately, on the left, on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see some of the complications of um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, such as graft rejection and acute and chronic graft versus host disease where the individual who has received the bone or cord um, mar um, transplant recognizes that cord or um, marrow as being unlike their own and develops an immunological response that could actually lead to almost like living with another chronic illness for those with sickle cell disease. Also um, with a lot of the um, preparative regimen, so getting the body ready to receive the transplant, that requires chemotherapy and often large amounts of chemotherapy in order to, to quote unquote, make room in the bone marrow for the new marrow to come in. In that situation, there are complications of those chemotherapeutic agents, such as infertility, which are often unacceptable to caregivers of children living with sickle cell disease who um, might be eligible for um, stem cell transplants and also uh, young adults. Unfortunately, um, with graft rejection comes the possibility of their disease relapsing as well. And so because of all of these concerns in the beginning, there was a lot of effort to try to make sure that individuals with sickle cell disease um, had better outcomes than some of the original studies suggested, which were pretty good with 88% um, being uh, cured for them from their sickle cell disease in early studies. Um, over the years, fortunately, this is a publication in blood in um, 2017 that shows the results of a thousand transplants um, from those, for those individuals with sickle cell disease who have a sibling who is a perfect match for transplant, who does not have sickle cell disease. And that is really important because that means that about 80% of individuals with sickle cell disease don't have an eligible donor. But we were able in this study to compile um, the results from three registries, um, really wanting to understand what the risk and benefits were of stem cell transplant in individuals with sickle cell disease in this decade. Um, and so this study looked at event-free survival and overall survival um, and found that it was closer to 91%. Um, percent. Um, the younger you are, if you were less than um, 16 years of age, the higher your event-free and overall survival compared to those that were older. And you know, this really 
makes sense when you see this because individuals with sickle cell disease, if you can imagine that they already have signs of organ damage by six months of age, you can imagine the, that by the time they're 20, 30, and 40, that they have significant in organ damage. So really trying to prevent in organ damage um, would possibly improve the outcomes of um, stem cell transplant in individuals with sickle cell disease. And that's something that I, it's important to point out because I'm gonna mention that when I talk about the clinical treatment. There's still um, the possibility of infection, graft versus host disease um, and mortality. Um, but what was shown is that if you were transplanted before the year 2006, as opposed to after 2006, that you had better outcomes. And we think that this is because transplant support, supportive care during transplant prevention of infections, all of that was getting better as well. And so um, we're much better now at taking care of patients with sickle cell disease who undergo stem cell transplants and improving outcomes. All right, so now that I've set the stage of um, the problems that individuals with sickle cell disease face, the therapies that they have access to, uh, but particularly the curative therapies if you have a donor. I really wanna talk now about some of the ethical issues that start to emerge when you talk about curative therapies in the setting. First of all, there is no severity score for sickle cell disease. I cannot predict who at birth is gonna have significant problems for their disease. So oftentimes I'm asking families to make decisions um, in a black box without knowing whether or not their child in the first year of life, for example, um, is really going to be as symptom free 30, 40, or 50 years down the road. We have data on hydroxyurea therapy. We know that starting it early in life, you can prevent some of the um, significant acute complications and may be able to increase survival. So the recommendation now is to start hydroxyurea therapy, this disease modification in the first year of life. Um, but again, I don't have good data for families as to those that will continue to benefit from hydroxyurea across a lifetime. We know that certain disease genotypes are more likely to have problems than others. The SS type of sickle cell disease um, is one of those that um, population-wise has the mo more acute and long-term complications. However, I can have somebody who has the SC type, which is population-wise a milder phenotype or genotype that can have more problems than those with the SS type. So even though it works for population norms, it doesn't work well when you're counseling fair, um, families about um, disease severity for their children. Um, I already mentioned the fact that outcomes of transplant are better um, the earlier they're done, but remember also that the earlier they're done, the less the likelihood that I can provide some type of fertility preservation. Most of the fertility preservation techniques, you really need a patient to go through puberty first um, in order to have full access, even though we now have some experimental therapies with banking tissues. Um, um, we really do not um, have good methods of being able to tell families um, that we can uh, reliably preserve fertility in very young children. So subsequently, not only we're asking parents to be surrogates for the decision-making for curative therapies, but we're also asking them to be surrogates for fertility preferences for their children as well. And I think that that becomes incredibly complicated. All right, now turning away from that, I've kind of like laid the setting for, you know, this intervene early in life, um, diagnose in the newborn period, start infection prevention, screen for stroke risk, intervene with um, transfusions for those at high risk for stroke, screen for in-organ damage, and then try to address um, treating in-organ damage, 
for curative therapies for, for right now, uh, we know what to do if there is a brother or a sister who's a perfect match. But because of graft versus host disease, because of graft rejection, it is experimental to have a donor that is not a brother or a sister that's a good match. Um, and that's because of those higher um, um, risk associated with match unrelated transplant. So therefore other curative therapies such as stem cell transplant with alternative donors are really reserved for those individuals with sickle cell disease who have problems. Um, not those who are at high risk for problems, but those who have actually experienced problems. Um, so that's just another way of saying that um, when we look at this emerging clinical paradigm, um, we have to also then realize that we're counseling parents across the lifespan. So if they have a HLA identical sibling that is a perfect match, and that individual has a severe genotype of sickle cell disease, such as SS or S beta zero, then that person is often transplant whenever that sibling donor is available. Um, we always start disease modifying therapies with hydroxyurea as early as possible. Um, but then we then have to monitor closely to see when it's time to offer um, curative therapies using alternative donors to individuals with sickle cell disease who are outside of that eligibility group for um, um, allogeneic um, stem cell transplant from a sibling donor. So I think I've kind of mentioned some of the barriers, but I just wanna talk about some other things that come up um, when we're talking to families about stem cell transplant. First of all, stem cell transplant is relatively new, even though it's been around since um, the mid 90s um, to many providers who care for individuals with sickle cell disease. Um, so sometimes providers don't even discuss curative therapies for individuals with sickle cell disease because they believe that they're too risky. Um, and I think that that is incredibly problematic. I think that everybody should hear about the possibilities for curative therapies for their children um, as well as for them, themselves as, an, as adults. I do believe that there are um, centers that do um, have these discussions very well. Um, they often are centers where there's good collaboration between the transplant team and the sickle cell um, expert team. Um, one of those areas is here at CHOP and I'll talk about our program a little bit later. These discussions are really important because even in talking about when to screen um, using HLA testing of siblings, the discussions become very, very personal, especially when you're doing them in the setting of a young child um, and who might even have other siblings in the room. So really understanding how to ask about whether or not the child has a full sibling, um, where to document that privately in the, in the health record is really a big issue. Um, again, I've talked about the short-term and long-term complications, but really addressing fertility issues with this patient population is important. Um, individuals here in the US, particularly black and brown people feel just as strongly, I believe, about the right um, um, to have children as the right not to have children. And so it's been very important that we make access to fertility preservation often not covered um, by any kind of Medicaid, Medicare, and often many third-party payers uh, struggle to um, justify um, the cost of doing the fertility preservation procedure, but then the cost of storage often um, have to be assumed by the family. So that's another uh, problem um, with um, economics and making sure that the families um, have um, full accessibility to fertility preservation, not by income. I think whenever you are um, dealing with um, therapies around sickle cell disease, we only have one that's clinically available for cure, which is having that brother or sister that's a perfect match. Um, but when you're talking about either alternative donors or gene therapy, which I'm gonna get into, that requires clinical research. And so, 
all of the issues around doing clinical research um, for rare disease in a marginalized population in vulnerable populations all emerge um, when you get outside of just having that perfect match from a brother or sister. Um, I think the indirect cost associated with curative therapies are not just related to fertility preservation, but a lot of things about what the family has to do in order to get through that procedure from travel to the hospital, through care for other children. Um, and then of course, many families um, want to create that perfect donor for their child. So IVF um, and trying to get coverage for in vitro fertilization or other reproductive assisted techniques is often difficult through third party payers as well. So again, these uh, financial barriers. The other psychosocial issues related to this population that are a little bit different is whenever you're doing informed consent, whether or not you're explaining a um, standard of care or whether or not you're consenting for an experimental procedure, um, you really have to consider that many individuals with sickle cell disease may have neurocognitive differences that mean that you have to explain things in a way that they can really understand. So making sure that you're screening for health literacy is really important in this process as would be any chronically ill population. I talked about the fact that you need to have an alternative donor if one is not available um, for this patient. Um, the other way to address the lack of available donors is through gene therapy. And gene therapy has emerged um, on the scene really since about 2010 in the sickle cell space. Um, and I'll talk about the first uh, case in published literature in 2017. Gene therapy can be done by removing stem cells from the individual with sickle cell disease, um, actually then taking them through a process that either inserts a gene that prevents the sickle hemoglobin from acting badly or editing genes in order to correct the sickle mutation or change another mutation that makes fetal hemoglobin, which I said really reduces the risk of the sickle hemoglobin acting badly. If you could um, increase the fetal hemoglobin through editing, that is considered a cure. And other ways of doing this is to insert a gene that actually can also pr produce a hemoglobin um, that is not specifically fetal hemoglobin, but can have an anti-sickling mechanism. And so those are the gene therapies that I'm going to talk about. The first patient um, that was um, that went through gene therapy was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017. That process was through gene insertion um, and um, studies got underway. Um, we really have studies now that multiple studies through multiple companies that are using lentiviral vectors for gene insertion or gene editing uh, techniques in order to um, perform clinical trials uh, with mechanisms of hopefully uh, reducing red cell sickling long-term and curing sickle cell disease. This has um, really leapt into popular press very quickly. Um, 60 Minutes did a report in March of 2019, um, really talking about one individual that had been through this process. And because the sickle cell community was really, I don't think appropriately prepared, there was a lot of confusion after um, this case um, reached um, the larger um, population. And I'm gonna talk about what some of the issues have been. Um, so of course, in the general concern, there's a mistrust of the medical community, um, traditionally in um, African and um, Americans and other black and brown communities. Um, and I think that um, the, we see these still play out in the sickle cell community. Um, the questions became really very odd. One, why was sickle cell so early in the process? Why were people quote unquote experimenting with the sickle cell population before allowing other um, populations to go first? Well, other populations have gone first. And when you talk to them, certain individuals with sickle cell disease about that, well then why was sickle cell so late? Um, and then the, there was confusion about the lentiviral vector, 
um, being um, that HIV was used and was whether or not HIV was gonna be given to individuals with sickle cell disease. There was confusion about whether or not this gene therapy was somatic or germline. So many individuals with sickle cell disease thought that if they went through this procedure, they would not have the capacity to pass on the sickle gene to their children, which is not correct. And so there was a lot that went on that needed to be um, expectation adjusted um, with a lot of the communications in the popular press about the first individuals going through um, gene therapy. I already talked about um, the issues around informed consent um, and I'll, I'll talk about the issues around what's defined cure later. Um, of course, the community felt um, really that um, the gene therapy was such a breakthrough. People were really interested until they realized that you still needed chemotherapy in order to go through the gene therapy. So you still had to go through the preparative regimen. So fertility issues remained a concern and the patient community felt like um, the medical community just wasn't listening to them. How are we going through um, with curative therapies that are um, still not gonna be accessible to most because of some of these barriers? And then who was gonna be accountable when things didn't go well? Um, who was that trusted, reliable um, monitor in the larger sickle cell community that would help advocate um, to make sure that clinical research was headed in the right direction. Again, we had more and more um, uh, releases um, in the New York Times about um, gene therapy and people being cured. And just when um, there was a lot of momentum getting behind um, these uh, therapies, we had um, an issue where in one trial, two individuals developed uh, leukemia and those um, and that trial was halted temporarily. Now that trial has been restarted, um, but that also put in the minds of individuals with sickle cell disease as to whether or not all of the benefits and the risk associated um, with this um, with gene therapies were being explained to individuals who were participating in trials. I'm going to stop for a moment um, for me to take a break personally. Um, because I think that it's really important to not only take the societal perspective on curative therapies, but also to really make sure that the patient voice is heard and that we're addressing things from a patient perspective. Hertz Nazir, um, a 48-year-old Haitian artist living um, with sickle cell disease at this time of the, the um, photograph, uh, was a huge advocate um, for um, sickle cell to reduce the sick stigma associated with pain. Um, he unfortunately um, was admitted to the hospital multiple times for pain episodes um, and then sent home before he was ready because he was accused of drug sinking or malingering. His art was a way of expressing his frustration with the disparities that individuals with sickle cell disease experienced. And one of the great insults he felt was the scale that we use to communicate about pain in the sickle cell community. Um, and, you know, unfortunately in general, on, we often say on a scale of zero to 10, where 10 is the worst pain you've ever experienced, what is your pain today? And half, having been sent home after a rough night in the emergency room, Hertz went home to paint um, the sickle cell series, the first of which is called 10 Redefined. And this was his way of saying, um, I cannot explain to you how badly I feel, how much pain I'm in. And also the, um, the stigma and the, the shame that the community makes me feel because I need opioids in order to get pain relief. He hated using opioids. He actually called them brain killers because he, that made them you know, feel so foggy. And it was his um, desire that um, individuals with sickle cell disease would not suffer any longer. And he really felt that the way to prevent suffering was to reach for that perfect red blood cell, um, the cure for sickle cell disease. And so uh, Hertz was a big advocate of gene editing um, and really um, spent the last few years of his life trying to get into gene therapy trials. 
um, for sickle cell disease. Um, and that um, image on the right hand side of the screen is called hope. So I ask ourselves as we move into a discussion about solutions, what does cure really mean? It's very personal and different for many people. For Hertz, cure meant not suffering from pain anymore. But I don't know that it meant that he um, would have not taken that option if that option meant that he wasn't going to be cured for the long-term effects of sickle cell disease so that he would still die a premature death because of in organ damage. So I think that when we think about cure, um, we really need to understand that it may mean different things to individuals. And when you're living with a rare disease, um, you might have a tendency to overestimate the benefits and underestimate the risk associated with um, these curative options. So Hertz said, honestly, I don't know if my art can make a difference, but it's part of the puzzle. There is nothing else I can give to this world. The only thing I can do is to create this tapestry and hope that when it's seen, it will touch people that have the power to make a difference. Um, and so I'm naming this lecture Hope Redefined because I think we should challenge ourselves to think about what curative therapies mean, not only to, the, to society um, and the sickle cell community, but individuals and to make sure that whatever we're doing to focus on solutions that it always goes back to the personal level. So we've kind of like outlined uh, many of these issues um, ethically. We have uh, difficulty with access to um, curative therapies because of lack of donors, lack of a center that um, has expertise in this, um, lack of geography um, where many individuals who live in sub-Saharan Africa where sickle cell disease predominates do not have access to some of these uh, curative therapies. All of the other um, ethical issues related to these processes I've outlined previously. So the first thing we can do for solutions is provide access to high quality care. I'm gonna talk about some things that are going on nationally and some of these things locally. One of the things that I'm really excited about is high quality care across the lifespan. Prasanna Sayani, Eric Russell under the um, um, mentorship of uh, Charles Abrams here has started an adult focused sickle cell center at Penn um, over the last um, five years. And it's just wonderful to have colleagues um, right next door that are also focused on improving the quality of life of those living with sickle cell disease. We have a cured clinic. We have a clinic, a consultative clinic here at CHOP that um, focuses on um, providing information to individuals with sickle cell disease um, both inside our institution, inside the Penn system and outside the Penn system and does consultations with family where the um, fertility um, specialists, the psychologists, the social workers, the transplanters and the sickle cell experts all work in one uh, clinic area. So the family can come in, see these experts all in one visit um, and go home with recommendations. Um, I think the other thing is to on a national level raise um, the sickle cell voice. And through um, the Assistant Secretary for Health for the last administration sponsored a National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine report called um, uh, the Sickle Cell um, Strat Blueprint for Action, which developed a strategy where we asked ourselves, are there resources for sickle cell disease um, so that the individuals have access to high quality care and research opportunities if not, why? What are we going to do about it? And who is we? And that report uh, was um, also in the context of ethicists and sociologists who worked with us to really understand the context of providing these recommendations, given the marginalization of the sickle cell population, the impact of stigma and racism, the mistrust of the community, and the poor communication often between patients and providers. So this report um, was published in September of last year. And um, one of the things that um, I think is one of the big pluses is the recognition 
um, that there is a problem in uh, the sickle cell community. A sickle cell disease predominantly affects Black Americans. It exists in the context of racism, socioeconomic disparities, and unequal levels of research, um, and, and also unequal national attention. The report recommends that NIH designate sickle cell as a health disparity to incentivize research and um, that HHS fund efforts to identify and mitigate disparities in mortality and health outcomes. That was a huge um, asset to the sickle cell community that has been able to see policy changes um, that have impact clinical milestones um, after um, legislation emerges from reports like this. I think one of the other things that's interesting about this report is as we outlined the recommendations, we wanted to make sure that the vision was to have long, healthy, productive lives for those with sickle cell disease and wanted to the IOM safety, um, high quality initiatives ec um, ethical because we think that many individuals with sickle cell disease um, don't feel like they've been provided respectful, compassionate care. Um, and, and really hinged in the under, underpinning of all of this is shared decision-making. Really making sure that individuals with sickle cell disease know about curative options, know about novel therapies, and that it's discussed with them across the lifespan. Increase awareness. With George Floyd came new input on um, social um, justice initiatives um, to level the playing field. And with that, a lot of editorials in um, prominent journals like the New England Journal of Medicine um, and others um, in the UK where we can actually use sickle cell as an example um, for where we need to make an impact on the um, results of systemic racism and social injustice. And what we could do to incentivize young people in medicine uh, to take on um, sickle cell disease um, from a scientific and a medical basis, um, but also with this social justice underpinning. Um, we also know that one of the ways that we can address um, some of the disparities and the ethical issues is making sure that the patient voice is heard. We need to understand um, patient perspectives and attitudes better, understand barriers to informed consent, um, make sure that we are including the patient community in the development of clinical and clinical research initiatives, and improve advocacy initiative, initiatives to influence health policy changes. Um, and of course, we wanna make sure that whatever we're doing, it's relevant. Um, we consider the source and try to find the most trusted member of the stakeholders in our community to deliver the messages to the patient community and do it in a context where they can actually be educated um, about some of the issues, particularly around curative therapies. We have federal efforts. The Cure Sickle Cell Initiative is being, has been launched by NIH um, where they want to have a cure for sickle cell that is universal within the next 10 years. And the first bullet on this is really interesting because they have included patients and caregivers in their uh, committees to develop strategies. Vince Bonham has been a huge advocate for um, sickle cell and his work at the National Human Genome Research Institute um, is um, summarized in an upcoming slide. And also the, the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America has been also trying to advocate for bringing the patient voice um, forward. Vince's um, work has really looked at surveys um, and patients on curative options, asking them what their opinions are about stem cell transplant compared to three different types of gene therapies. And that's been published recently and also um, really trying to understand stakeholder barriers to inform consent for gene therapies and, and piloting a video to educate um, families and individuals with sickle cell disease about gene therapies before informed consent is obtained. The American Society of Hematology, uh, Charles Abrams here at um, Penn has really advocated uh, having a community patient focus group as part of a research collaborative that the American Society of Hematology is sponsoring. And locally, we have groups um, that have popped up that are advocating for um, pediatric like adult focus care um, for adults living with sickle cell disease and also um, reproductive justice. And with that, I will say thank you. And hopefully I have left time for questions. Thank you so much. Um, that was really great. And we, we have plenty of time for questions. 
So I want to invite um, everybody who's listening in to either use the raise hand function and we can call on you or you can post your question in the chat and I can read it out, whatever you prefer. And while people are thinking, um, let me let me get started, um, Dr. Smith Whitley, with a question um, about your your recent move into um, into industry. But you're kind of straddling industry and academia, and so I thought it might be helpful um, to talk a little bit about what you're able to accomplish in each type of work that you do, right? What you might be able to do outside of academia in an industry setting, and and vice versa. So thanks for that question, Holly. It was um, really a big decision for me. Um, and it came at a time where I had really initiated many of the programs at CHOP that I wanted to get off the ground as examples for ways to improve um, high quality um, uh, pediatric care um, and make it accessible for those living with sickle cell disease. Um, and one of the things that I found was a huge rate limiting step is the fact that we only have four drugs for sickle cell disease. And when I'm sitting down doing shared decision making and talking to families about how to keep their kids healthy until we get better at gene therapies, it's very frustrating that I have a chemotherapeutic agent and that's it. Um, glutamine is not available until age five voxelator until age 12, and then crizolizumab until age 16. Um, and by that time, many of the uh, end organ um, complications have occurred. So I really think that um, my move was very much so stimulated by the possibility of making a broader impact by increasing um, drug development opportunities for, in, for the sickle cell community and really trying to do it with an organization or a private um, entity that I thought was committed to the sickle cell space. So finding an organization of 400 people um, that are all committed to sickle cell disease, improving the lives of those with sickle cell disease was very important for me. Um, and the opportunity to bring um, socially responsible drug development into the forefront um, where I had an opportunity to voice my concerns to make sure that we address the sickle cell population as vulnerable, that we knew that it was um, a rare disease here in the US that we had to make sure that people got informed consent the right way for certain clinical trials, and also the issues related to doing clinical trials in Sub-Saharan Africa and making sure that there was social responsibility there. And shortly after joining GBT, the Social Empowerment Committee was formed the Health Equity Council, and now the GBT Foundation. Um, and so I'm hoping that it will allow me to have broader impact, raise um, the voice of the sickle cell patients, and also um, be able to hopefully long-term continue to do my work on influencing health policy for this patient population. Great, thank you. And we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, Noamaka, can I ask you to unmute and, and ask your question? Sure, <clears throat> absolutely. Thanks so much for that engaging talk, Dr. Smith Whitley. I'm a nephrologist here, an adult nephrologist here, um, and I have a few sickle cell patients with um, chronic kidney disease. And I'm just struck by how I don't ever see um, transplant rays, even for some who really have mild kidney disease, and really that's it no heart dysfunction, no other end organ damage. And so you know, is there a push to, you know, maybe expand some of these therapies to those who do have end organ damage that is not severe? Absolutely. And I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, oh. It's one of the reasons that um, Hertz was um, excluded from trials. Um, either he had, quote unquote, too much end organ damage, or he was too old for a lot of the trials. So we're trying to actually work on um, preparative regimens that do not have as intense chemotherapy so that if you have renal disease, if you have liver disease, you're able to tolerate the preparative regimen. The other thing that I'm excited about is the opportunity to pursue in vivo stem cell transplants where you don't have to take the cells out. You don't have to manipulate them, which I think is one of the reasons that we may be seeing some of these um, uh, pre-leukemic and leukemic conditions. Um, where you can actually do the trans, the gene therapy in vivo. That would make it transportable to some Saharan Africa. Hopefully we could do it in a way that was less expensive economically. Um, and that would be broadly 
um, acceptable um, for any individual with end organ damage also because they would not need to have these intense preparative regimens. So right now we're working on um, reducing the chemotherapy um, intensity. Also at CHOP, they're in the basic science labs, they're trying to work on um, monoclonal antibodies that can actually also prepare the bone marrow for um, to receive some of the gene therapies and stem or cell related therapies. And I think that that's promising as well. And then the last thing is, is that I think that um, we need to be really careful about not discussing curative therapies with our patients. Um, every patient has the right to understand what the options are and to be a part of that decision. Um, and so we're really trying to advocate here at CHOP and nationally um, so that every individual living with sickle cell disease knows curative options available for them across the lifespan. Thank you for that. Great. Steve, you're up next. Thanks, Holly. Um, oh, I realize you can't see me. Let me try to fix that. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Smith Whitley, for that uh, fabulous talk. And, you know, I practiced uh, bone marrow transplant at CHOP for a while as a pediatric hematologist, oncologist, and uh, got to see that, you know, what can, how, how things can go when they go right and how communication, as you described, between the various uh, specialties is, uh, is really in place. You mentioned with a number of the therapies that are available that they're not available on, uh, to patients until they're older, 5, 12, 16. As a pediatrician, you know, I've sort of long known about therapeutic orphanhood and the fact that things, takes a while for things to get studied in pediatric populations, made available to pediatric populations. This is going to be, a, a, obviously, the burden of sickle cell is really major in younger patients. Getting these curative therapies to kids is going to be really important. As you said, the earlier they're done, the better in, in many, many ways. So what, what are the barriers to actually studying it and making therapies available, whether they're the cur curative therapies or the supportive care drugs to kids and how can we overcome those barriers? Great question. And I know that you know so many of these answers, but one of the things that I really have been um, advocating for is is really having not only um, patients at the table when we're making these decisions, because some of the barriers are induced by the patient population themselves. You know, they are um, very um, inward about expressing their concerns um, or their hesitancy about different therapies. So we don't even know what barriers we have until we ask. And that's why I love Vince Bonham's work, because we have to ask the patients. So as you know, we will start with older individuals and then based on therapeutic response, start to dial back. Um, and these biometric approaches to clinical trial design are incredibly frustrating. And we have been advocating with FDA to really allow us to do a different approach. When you look at what just happened with the COVID-19 vaccine, we did not have to prove efficacy in the pediatric population, we could use a biomarker of immunologic response to get these important vaccines to the younger community quickly. So where can we use biomarkers? Where can we use other biometric approaches to dialing back the age safely in clinical trial design um, so that we can get to these younger populations faster? I think that's a big concern. The second is I think that as we disconnect myeloablative therapy from curative therapies, the faster we're gonna make advances. Families, as you know, have a really hard time making reproductive decisions for their children. And it's very painful to um, hear a family um, that is struggling, they wanna go back to Nigeria, they wanna go back to Ghana, that's their home country, and they wanna take their child living with sickle cell disease with them, but they're hesitant because they know they can't get the care they need there. So they want to have curative therapies for multiple reasons, because they don't want their child to die of sickle cell, but they also want to go home. And they're making these incredibly difficult decisions about reproductive options um, for their one, two, and three-year-olds. 
So I think that the other piece of this is just as much as we need to advocate for research that does not involve myeloablative therapies. We need to advocate for research and um, uh, fertility preservation also, so that we can actually get um, some of these uh, cures to the children that already have HLA identical siblings ready to go, um, whose families are just struggling with this issue. Great. Well, we, we are actually out of time. Um, there are two questions in the chat and we will make sure that those get forwarded to you um, in case there's the opportunity to follow up later. But thank you so much for a wonderful talk and thanks to everybody in attendance for supporting reps. We will see you next year. Thanks everyone. Thank you.